Hello, testing, testing audio. No. Testing audio. No. Hello, testing, testing. I think that's working. I'm seeing a thing here. Yeah, testing, testing. Yeah. Hey everybody, Mike Ward here with R3. We're going to get started in just two minutes. Thanks for joining. Just getting set up a little more.
All right, everybody, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So again, Mike Ward with R3 here. Thanks for joining us for the Architecture Working Group today. We have just a couple of things on the agenda today. I'm going to run through a couple of miscellaneous items. Uh, Adam and his team are going to, and Clay, are going to run through uh, the international payments project that you may have read about in the news a couple of weeks back. So we're going to run through what that project is uh, and some of the technical details. So Clay's joining us on that side. Uh, and then Andres is going to talk through performance work that we're doing uh, in Corda Enterprise, um, potentially some work uh, around Corda. So uh, he'll talk about kind of thematically where the areas of Corda are that we need that we're doing performance work, uh, and then dive into the details of that. So let's get started with some of the miscellaneous items. Just the housekeeping again. Uh, you can catch us uh, live streaming on YouTube. So. Um, you can also see these recorded sessions, all the past ones uh, since we've been public up on that YouTube channel. So the uh, bit.ly URL is up there, uh, head up there and you can watch all the past ones and any of the other materials we put up. If you have questions as we go through the session, put them in the Q&A window. Uh, the way Zoom works is there's a Q&A and a chat window. Uh, the Q&A window is probably preferred, but we'll also pick them up in the chat as we go. So we'll pause after each section to respond to any questions you may have. Uh, and as usual, if you have any feedback or any topics you'd like covered, drop me an email, mike.ward at r3.com. We also would love to hear about what projects you're working on uh, with Corda. So let us know and let us know how we can help you on that. So just a couple of things on Corda in the news. So uh, you may have seen this week the Corda Partner Network announcement. So we had 50 partners who uh, have kind of formally announced their work on Corda. So a uh, very large community of, of big systems integrators and ISVs. So if you are in the partner community and would like to join that, uh, shoot us an email, partner at r3.com. We'd love to, uh, to help you join that and get started on Corda. Uh, the next thing is in the news in the last couple of days, if you've been following the Monetary Authority of Singapore, um, they had a project called Ubin. Uh, and this is, was looking at distributed ledgers. Uh, this is phase two of that project. Uh, the, applying distributed ledger technology to uh, the real-time gross settlement systems. Uh, they actually had released the source code for that. So uh, Corda, of course, was one of the pro uh, platforms that was taking place in that project. The source code for the work we had done is uh, part of that open source release that uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has done. So you can follow the links up on their site. We'll put a link up on the Corda.net site. Um, but in the next session, we'll actually go through in more detail the work that we did in Ubin, uh, including trying to go through some of that code for you to show uh, what we actually implemented and what you can take advantage of uh, that was released as a part of that project. So look for that in the next session. And then just the last reminder um, to register for the enterprise preview. So uh, we will uh, on Corda.net and then we'll follow up with you in an email uh, as soon as we have news about what's coming uh, and dates. So. If you'd like to get your hands on the bits, uh, as well as just some of the news about what's coming out on that and get more formally involved, register up on Corda.net. So next up, I'm gonna pass over to Adam. Adam's going to talk about the International Payments Project. Great, um, thanks, Mike. Um, so you may have seen a little bit of news on this um, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, so we've been working in R3 with a number of uh, number of our partners, um, really for quite a while now, actually, sort of in, in in stealth mode, looking at different ways, different approaches to um, address uh, international payments challenges. Uh, there's a there's a lot of different options in this space, and obviously it's a very very challenging space. Um, so just a, I'll give a couple high level points around the initiative. And then we'll dive into some of the some of the, I think, the really interesting technical detail. So um, the the view of this and the vision is sort of a uh, an international payments product that's built by the industry for the industry. So there are uh, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of players in the space. It's a very complex and fragmented market. Um, and the way that the banks have been thinking about this, kind of in the construct of our three, is is how do we build something that will you know, A, be focused on the customer, right? Keep the customer in mind, not, not sort of the industry, you know, not, not the, the, the various existing players. How do we do something that's, that's best for the customer? Um, and how do we make that meaningful? Um, because it's, there, there's a lot of people in the space and, and what's kind of the unique, uh, the unique approach and the unique perspective. 
Uh, so it turns out there are a lot of unique uh, approaches and that, that Corda as a platform uh, is very, very well positioned um, to address those. So, so it's, a, it's an international payments product for the industry, by the industry, and with, with a lot of deep thinking about um, strategy. Second key thing is uh, we're, we're using it, and it uses um, digital representation, representations of fiat currency. Um, so without uh, intermediate cryptocurrencies, without the creation of, of new cryptos or, or crypto bridges, uh, so we think that's that's really important uh, for driving uh, for driving mass adoption, um, and we also think that um, some of those approaches around uh, in the crypto space are are absolutely fascinating. Um, but in, the, in in sort of the space of of, of regulated uh, payments for the industry, uh, potentially not ready for prime time, of course. But um, but it's a really interesting space um, that we're all watching very closely. Uh, so the solution right now is anchored around. Uh, digital representations of fiat currency. Um, and the third key thing is we've done a lot of deep thinking into to what what Mike mentioned earlier about you know Project Ubin and Project Jasper and Project Line Rock for for those of you who are not close to our code names those are the the project code names to, for the work that we're doing with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, the Bank of Canada and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. So R3 is one of the leaders in the space and and some of our partners are the leaders in the space building on top of Corda for these central bank projects. Uh, and what we want to do and, and what we've done is align really the, the, the broad roadmaps, both sort of the business model and the architectural roadmaps. So when the central bank digital currencies start coming online, uh, which, which in my humble opinion is a, is a question of, of when, not if, um, that those can be phased into the architecture as well. Uh, so that's a sort of high level view of, uh, of uh, how we're thinking about this. Um, and I'm going to pass to Clay now, who's um, He's one of our uh, one of the senior developers from from one of our partners on this project. We can get a little bit more into into the technical detail, which I think is uh, is really really fascinating. And before I hand to Clay, I think the point I'll make is that you know on this AWG call, we we typically talk or we sometimes talk you know quite in detail about the platform. And the the perspective that Clay is going to bring is is developing on top of the platform. So so basically, Clay Clay and team have been building a core app or a Corda application on top of the platform uh, for this space. Uh, so, so over to you, Clay. Uh, thanks, Adam. <clears throat> um, my name is Clay Rattle. Uh I'm a senior developer at uh, ThoughtWorks, um, and we are partnering with uh, R3 to help build uh, the Argent platform, which is the code name for their international payments platform. Um, the uh, It's been an interesting ride. Uh, the First off, this is sort of a greenfield project. You don't get very many of those. So it was a chance to start off from the bottom and kind of build up. Um, we are focused primarily on cash payments internationally. So I'm not sure how many people out there have been working directly with the cash contracts that's built into the finance package in Corda. Um, but uh, it's built off of the fungible asset interface. Um, it supports the basic uh, issuance, movement, and uh, exiting or uh, destruction. Uh, of your uh, of your uh, ledger items, um, the uh, the cash contract uh, uses a quarter defined uh, amount class. Um, that class uh, is of type that amount is of type currency. That's just the standard Java util currency that's built on top of. Um, the cash state carries a, a number of properties like uh, who the issuer is and that sort of thing. But by itself that is not enough to, to build a real world application on. You need a lot more information than that. Um, there's a lot of metadata for carrying a payment around. Um, so what we did was we used that as a, uh, as a building block. We took that basic, uh, that basic uh, cash contract, um, used the amount, and we wrapped around it a uh, customer credit transfer. If, you are, uh, if you're not big into finance, uh, the uh, customer, the credit transfer is what we would normally call in the real, as human beings, uh, that's a payment. Uh, that's me handing money to you. Um, uh, in the uh, ISO 2022 uh, standards put, uh, published by SWIFT, um, the uh, financial, institute, financial institute customer credit transfer is when I, as a customer of a bank, say I want my bank to pay 10 pounds to someone else at some other bank. It's just a straightforward thing. Um, so we had to build this customer credit 
transfer uh, state around that. That includes things like who the sender is, who the recipient is, uh, what uh, what the amount and currency is that they're transferring. Um, uh, additional information, uh, you know, uh, any specific uh, account information like the recipient's account number, if there are things like uh, IBAN or uh, SWIFT codes involved with it, those things need to be transferred with it. All of that has to be saved as a state. Um, so we really kind of uh, built, a, built a composite out of some, some, a couple of one or two very fundamental uh, uh, pack pieces of the uh, Court of Finance package. Um, the uh, the uh, if you if you want to sorry let me back up here um, a lot of these are are uh, maintained and uh, dealt with through individual flows one of the things that I've I have found very nice about the quarter architecture is that uh, the flows allow you to create a very almost functional like approach to compositing. Uh, all of the different things you're going to have to do. Um, if you're a fan of functional languages like I am, that's that's a big bonus. Um, also, if you're a fan of functional languages, the fact that you get to work in Kotlin to do this kind of stuff is <laughs> kind of fun. Um, but uh, so, the speaking of the ISO standards, let me go back. What is that up there? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, um, the ISO standards that we're using, um, we wanted to build those in early. Um, since we're dealing with international payments, this is a standard. So we actually have uh, a module in the project, which you can probably see up there on the branch is, branch is the one with the very top of the failing test, the S21 payment. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, that package, uh, that module allows us to build a, we take the XSD that is published by, by Swift for that specific uh, customer credit transfer that we're looking at. Uh, we use JAXP in the Gradle build and uh, generate the model based off of that XSD. Um, that gets, we constructed a couple of web APIs. Um, so we actually now have it, have the capability so that if a bank that is not on the quarter network um, knows the endpoint and is authorized, they can send that XML directly to that endpoint. We will consume that, transform it uh, into those model objects, and then process that uh, as a, process that into business objects and actually start a flow uh, that will carry out a uh, customer credit transfer so you can make a payment to another bank that is on the Corda network, even if you aren't. So as long as the bank is using the ISO standards for 2022, they're in, they don't actually have to be on it in order to participate in the network. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you can, I guess, based on this slide, you can kind of see this is, uh, uh, we kind of take, we would like to take an agile approach to that. Um, part of that is that we, try and build uh, the minimum viable product, the MVP, for the functionality that we absolutely have to have. Um, right now, this is, I guess, a screenshot of the Team City server uh, that we use for our integration server. Um, the little inset down there at the bottom right is what we, what we use on a daily basis. That's our little build monitor to let us know uh, uh, what's going on at any given moment. Um, uh, this, is, this all sets up... Uh, Pretty standard stuff. First, you start locally. Um, we use uh, Spec Stack is pretty straightforward. We use Gradle uh, for our build process, so it's kind of uh, machine uh, agnostic. Um, we uh, run through Gradle. That takes care of any any artifact generation. Um, we try to avoid checking in things that are generated because that's just not good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, once we get that cleared, put it through the linter, get all that stuff, get it checked in and pushed. Uh, we would like to go to a, a trunk-based development system. However, uh, the team that's working with Arjun is uh, pretty multinational. We've got, uh, we've got a group of people in Korea. We've got a group of people in Canada. We've got people in uh, close to our time zone in France. Uh, and, of course, here uh, at London where the core work goes on. Uh, so it gets a little bit risky uh, trying to uh, trying to merge all that stuff directly into master with uh, a disparate team with uh, a lot of communication challenges going on. So uh, for the, for now, what we have is we have a branch build. So we'll do a typical uh, like Git flow uh, where you'll do branch builds, make a pull request, get it reviewed, get it merged and run it through the build process. Um, typical practices. If the master build goes, goes red, you panic and everybody drops everything until it goes green again. Um, 
the uh, you know standard uh, stand-ups. We do a lot of handoffs because we are running through multiple time zones. We do a stand-up in the morning in which we catch the Koreans at around 8 p.m. their time. They do a handoff to us uh, around 4.45 in the afternoon here in London. We'll do a stand-up with guys in Canada and then do a handover to them. They're just starting their work day. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been entertaining and pretty challenging. Um, we still got a, still have a lot of things we can improve on, but, uh, I think for as small a team as we are distributed across the, uh, the world as we are, I think we've done pretty well. Um, the, uh, the experience that I've had so far as a, as a developer, uh, on Corda, trying to build an application that is, that is, you know, uh, a real world kind of worthy, um, the architecturally, I, I really like it. I especially, like I said, I especially like the way that the flows are, um, that you can composite those flows together in a very functional fashion. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm a big functional fan. Uh, the, uh, the challenges, the biggest challenges that we've had are the core pieces are there, but uh, there's, a, there, there's still some, some room to grow when it comes to, uh, to having a more, uh, uh, more production specific kind of stuff. It takes a lot of work to get to get things like, uh, uh, for example, if you want to have a uh, have an audit trail, um, exception handling in a in a graceful manner across uh, a distributed network. These are not trivial things to put together uh, in a in a genericized fashion that are that are useful for everyone involved. Um, so we've been, but we have found that we can a lot of the things pieces that we have found aren't there because they're not those fundamental building blocks, we can construct ourselves easily as another flow on top of that and just introduce that uh, as a composite uh, inside that flow chain. And we can record that stuff as needed. Um, so that's, that's a, well, everything is not there. Everything is there that you need in order to get, in order to build what is necessary for you to function. Um, and I think that's probably my time at this point. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the overview. Um, and if you guys want to learn more information about that project, I think that uh, you can drop me an email and I'll try and find uh, the appropriate contact for you. Um, so next up, we wanted to cover the performance work um, that we're doing in Corda. Uh, so some of this performance work will end up in Corda Enterprise. Uh, it's kind of to be determined specifically which version of Corda uh, and the time frame on it. But we wanted to give you an idea of the performance work that's underway uh, so you can provide us feedback on it and understand what to anticipate. So I'm going to pass over to Andres. Uh, <clears throat> hi, this is uh, Andres Flemmer. I'm a developer here at R3. Uh, I've been working on the uh, performance improvements and uh, also SGX. Um, so uh, let's get right into it. So I'm basically going to split um, the performance uh, stuff into two bits. One is uh, about uh, checkpoints and one is about multi-threading. And I'll also later uh, go into other bottlenecks that we have but are currently aren't um, addressing. Um, so one of the biggest bottlenecks currently are, are checkpoints. Uh, and what are checkpoints? Basically, uh, whenever um, a piece of business logic in, in a core app or in, in a flow executes and, uh, and uh, it suspends on something like a send or a receive, from another uh, party or potentially some other API call, we uh, create a checkpoint, which means we um, persist the uh, complete state of the flow to the database, um, and then we we resume and uh, we do this because if if something fails, then we uh, want to be able to restore the state from the database. However, these are very expensive, um, and furthermore, uh, this is uh, multiplied by the fact that the node is single threaded, so uh, the this checkpoint thing creates a giant contention point uh, for the whole uh, flow framework. Um, so just an example uh, uh, about what's happening uh, in this uh, picture, uh, there are two flows executing um, and uh, A and B, and B receives a message while uh, A is um, uh, checkpointing, uh, that means that we cannot do any handling of the of the message from B. We have to wait until A checkpoints, and then we will need to do another checkpoint to persist the received message 
and only then can we resume B with the received message. So this is a giant uh, pain because uh, while this is happening, we block the uh, the message handlers um, and everything single threaded. So we have to wait for everything to finish be before we can continue with the actual business logic. And we really want to maximize the time spent on the business logic rather than time spent on checkpointing. Um, so as uh, as part of the multi-threading slash checkpoint removing work, um, we had to uh, basically create a pure state machine uh, for the underlying flow framework. Uh, currently in master, we have a sort of ad hoc mutable state implementation, um, which is very bad for multi-threading because you can't actually reason about um, the different executors in an isolated manner. So the the first big step uh, is or was actually um, about to submit the big PR uh, for this um, is is to create uh, an actual state machine uh, that drives the the flow framework. Um, and uh, uh, as part of this work, um, we had to isolate the different states that uh, each uh, each flow is operating on. Um, and then it's very easy to multi-thread because we, we can do local uh, reasoning. Um, so as part of this, we, we separated out uh, the, the business logic state that the core app is depending on and the internal flow framework state that we, we use for bookkeeping. Um, and uh, on this slide, you can see a couple of pieces of the state machine. Um, so these are things like uh, how the, the flow is dirtied when, when an exception happens and uh, like what happens with session negotiation and things like that. Um, so this is great. Uh, once we do this, um, we, can, uh, we can run uh, flows concurrently. Uh, however, the database access will still be a bottleneck. Um, and in general, um, we want to somehow reduce database accesses. So, um, so again, why do we checkpoint? Uh, we do it because if if a hard failure happens, like uh, somebody plugs out the power supply or something, we still want to um, be able to restore uh, the state of the flows um, in in a consistent and reliable manner. Uh, manner. Um, so the way we do this is so in, in this example, a, a a failure happens while executing some user code. Uh, but because we checkpointed uh, at, at, the, at the receive call, we can just restart uh, the flow uh, from that point on. Um, and of course, this means that some of the user code will be replayed, um, which is uh, which is quite unsafe, uh, especially if it has uh, I/O. Um, so this is this is something that we require uh, from core app developers to uh, to think about that basically between checkpoints. Uh, you need to be prepared for for your code to re be replayed in, ca in case a uh, hard failure happens. Um, but we can we can take this idea and, and take it a bit further. Um, and to explain a little bit about how we can take this further, uh, uh, I'll explain a concept called uh, idempotency, um, which basically describes uh, a property that uh, if you have some kind of action. Um, if you execute that action twice, you should get the same result as executing the uh, action once. And if we had this property when it comes to flows uh, or business logic, uh, it would be very easy to uh, to do rest restoration on failure because we can just replay the whole thing without worry worrying about uh, uh, duplication or something. So um, a common example of this uh, uh, are sort of the general cases like database transactions. Like if you do an operation in database transaction, like a, a read or write, but you haven't yet committed the transaction, it's safe to replay the transaction because it's not yet committed. Um, so this allows sort of uh, an at atomic way of reasoning about these these effects uh, in one go. Um, we, uh, another example is uh, is reliable messaging like MQ, where we do um, uh, retries and we do acknowledgments and uh, and deduplication explicitly. Uh, again, we can we can replay the, the send of the message because uh, we we get, we get the guarantee that if it was already received, we deduplicate it, um, and we need an, an acknowledgement before we 
uh, stop retrying the send. And there are, also, of course, other examples of this. But basically, um, these are just ex uh, uh, examples of, of things that if the flow does, uh, it allows us to basically skip check checkpoints completely. Um, if, if a flow block happens to be idempotent, uh, that means that we don't need to checkpoint it um, when it does uh, some kind of uh, suspending call uh, because we, we have the guarantee that we can replay the whole block uh, when uh, the hard failure happens. Um, so this is, this is a feature that, that we added to Enterprise. Uh, and uh, it actually makes sense because uh, that it's an enterprise feature because it's very easy to get wrong. If you don't, if, if your product is not idempotent, then on a hard failure, the whole thing will be replayed uh, and, uh, and things go wrong. So it makes sense that it's a business feature and that we can provide some support uh, in evaluating whether your flow or, or providing test uh, testing to, uh, to know that your flow is actually idempotent. So, um, so the, these are the, the two major features that, that are currently uh, are being developed. Um, but I, I, uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, other issues that we have, and actually multi-threading revealed that we have other uh, bottlenecks as well. So the first, the first point is database contention, which is a, a giant pain. Um, uh, at the top, you can see what we would like to have which is that if we have two threads executing uh, some flows, then we want the checkpoint to happen in parallel. However, H2 is, um, is a database that has a giant lock inside. Uh, so we lose all the parallelism that we gained by multi-threading the, uh, uh, the flows. And while one uh, thread is checkpointing, the other is blocked because uh, the database is blocked. So the, the solution is, of course, to move to a multi-threaded database. Um, and uh, we designed Core in a way that, that makes it easy to switch between database implementations. So, so this is, I think this is actually, this might be uh, in development right now um, already. So it's, it's coming along. Uh, the other big uh, issue that we, we noticed was with soft locking. Uh, so soft locking is specific to fungible states. So if we have uh, some cache in the vault um, split into like a thousand states, um, if we do things naively, we will, uh, and we have two flows running in parallel, they will uh, select the same states to spend. Um, uh, and we want to avoid this. We want them to select uh, different states. Um, of course, if you select the same states, it will fill at an authorization time, but we don't want to we want to prevent that before that because that's a, that's a sort of a hard failure of of the, the um, of of the flows if if uh, if the transaction commit fails at no authorization time. We want to prevent that uh, as much as possible. Um, so the way we do this currently is a, is, a, is a, by using the, uh, the database as a lock, which um, which is really slow and bad. And uh, if the locking fails, then we just do this um, exponential back off. Uh, that's really slow, and once you start adding uh, threads uh, and more parallelism into the node, it will blow up uh, even more. So we really want to avoid this. Um, and of course, the solution is to somehow move to a, a an in-memory self-locking implementation. Uh, and there are a couple of things that need to be done uh, for this to happen. Uh, and we obviously shouldn't have any back off. Um, uh, so uh, I also, so th this is the last slide. I just wanted to like briefly discuss like really long-term vision of, of how uh, really high performance could be achieved. Um, and the first step will be, would be to move all disk IO out of the node and basically make the node completely CPU and, uh, and network bound. Um, so this would require moving the broker out of the node. This would require moving the database out of the node and basically have everything separate and uh, horizontally scalable. Um, another thing uh, uh, we could do is, is, um, is use a, a transactional memory type uh, of model where uh, each flow works off of a, a snapshot or sort of a, an in-memory state. 
and uh, that's very easy to to make reliable because we can just uh, throw away the in-memory log and it's also very uh, efficient and only when you reach a point where you do some IO do, uh, do you do the uh, uh, like a database flushes or network operations um, and this sort of ties into um, another thing we we are uh, planning to do which is provide a uh, restrictive DSL kind of language uh, instead of the uh, very liberal current uh, flow API that will uh, allow us as the flow framework uh, developers to basically compile uh, a flow into a very efficient uh, pipeline rather than um, sort of uh, working around the fact that the flows can do anything currently. Um, if, if we have some guarantees from the users that we that they don't do uh, arbitrary IO in the flows, um, then we can do a lot of optimizations uh, by batching different IOs and uh, and basically scheduling uh, these operations in the way we want to. Um, so that's sort of the very long term vision. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's for me. Excellent, thanks, Andres. So we do have uh, one question from Charles, which I'll take. So uh, Charles notes the review of the performance issues and the fact that correction of these issues will only be applied to enterprise means that one can't expect to build a real scalable solution uh, in production based on Cordo open source. Uh, otherwise, what we simply call Cordo at this point, non-enterprise, would you not agree? So I think um, we're, you know, we continue to develop both, both versions of the product, um, the forefront of our development at the moment for some of the performance work and other non-functional items is an enterprise. Um, but that said, uh, we're still obviously uh, continuing to push forward on Corda, broadly speaking. So um, I think we will have kind of a much more detailed roadmap, Charles, that we'll, we'll walk through uh, in a couple months here um, once things are shaken out a bit, because this is a lot of this capability is still in early development. Uh, and we're always looking for feedback from the community. So. And Charles, I know you've registered for the enterprise program, so we'll we'll get this in your hands very soon, also. Uh, and if there's not any other questions, we we'll have one more comment. Yeah, I've got um, just one comment, picking up on uh, some of what Clay was saying on um, on the build experience on the, the international payments product. He mentioned ISO 20022. So, so for those of you who may not be um, sort of standards geeks. <laughs> ISO, uh, which, which probably is a lot of us, um, ISO 2022 is a uh, is an industry-wide standard. So it's an ISO standard, as, as 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 the name suggests. But it's a really, really interesting standard, and something we're really excited about, sort of across across our three and across all of the, the 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 builders on top of Corda. So ISO 2022 has kind of two parts to it, and I'm, I'm vastly oversimplifying this. One part is a messaging standard, which sort of replaces the old MT messages for those of you um, who have been in the payment space and in finance, um, which is interesting, but but not not hugely valuable for quarter based solutions. Although consuming those messages um, is certainly something that people are doing. It's more around the the business domain and the business objects standards in ISO 20 or 22, which which map really really nicely to quarter state objects. Um, so for those of you who are interested in taking that discussion forward and maybe interested in that space, and, and standards in general are so important, there's a channel in the public Slack called ISO 2022 on Corda. Uh, there's a recording there of a, of a walkthrough that we did with some of the team from SWIFT uh, looking at standards. And there is some sample code as well for a code generator. Uh, it's open source code that generates Corda state objects from the ISO 2022 standard. So I think that's really, really exciting. It's still early days, but it's really exciting um, to how, and, and it, it sort of, it, it talks about how we're looking at and how we can build in standards um, and adopt standards from core app builders and make it, may actually make it lower friction to use standards than it is to do it yourself. And I think that's a really powerful statement because standards will be adopted that way. And Corda and its state object design maps very, very nicely to some of the standards. So if you're interested, check out that Slack channel to um, to continue the conversation. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. So a uh, uh, couple questions. One is ISO, Charles asked ISO 2022. I think it's ISO 200, it's 222, correct? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Some people call it ISO 2022. I have no clue why. Yeah. Because uh, the, the middle is, uh, is, is actually a zero and not an O, but um, that, that's <laughs> a, a cool way to say it. So, so yes, go ahead, Mike. So, then that's just an ISO standard. Around, I, um, I, I, <clears throat> it might actually be a different, that's a different ISO standard on how you pronounce that ISO standard. <laughs> uh, uh, Atisha had asked if you can share the link for the, uh, in the meeting for uh, the SWIFT code demo. Uh, yes, it's all in the public Slack. Okay. Um, so it's all publicly available there. The code is open source as well. So I don't know if you do, how, how do you do minutes uh, of this or something? We can put some notes up. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can put notes up on, uh, on the so Slack. We'll, yeah. we'll put a link up on uh, Corda.net. And uh, otherwise, if you're not familiar, we have Slack.Corda.net uh, is the Slack channel. So the, and the public channel being the general channel there. In fact, I'll leave that unresolved. Um, Yes, Charles asked, confirm that. Charles has got it. Excellent, sorry. Uh, there is a question from an anonymous attendee. If I develop a Cord app on Corda, will it work um, the same on Corda Enterprise? Are all the enterprise improvements on the node becoming a jar dash and jar? Or will R3 members running enterprise also be able to interoperate with non-enterprise nodes? So I, I think there's a couple of things packed in here. I would, I would separate out the notion of R3 membership and um, Corda in any form. Um, so anybody, of course, can run Corda, uh, and anybody uh, will be able to run Corda Enterprise, um, and you can get that into the preview program on that, as we discussed. Uh, of course, that'll be a commercial version. There is uh, a design principle here, a guiding principle, I guess you'd say, around uh, Corda apps that are developed uh, towards Corda uh, will also run on the Enterprise version, so what I think of as um, upward compatibility. Um, but the reverse may not be true, depending on what APIs are introduced to enterprise. We we aim, of course, not to introduce uh, new APIs when possible. Um, so, and there's there's uh, that that will be something we talk about in, in greater detail when we have a much more detailed roadmap. So, what we're trying to do with enterprise at this point is let you know our uh, current development process, where we are, and uh, each of these AWG sessions is a chance to talk more about the capabilities coming. But in principle, we would we are aiming for Corda. Uh, Corda apps to run on both Corda and Corda Enterprise. Uh, and Clark confirmed that uh, it's called 2022 because the prior standard was called 15.0. Apparently. <laughs> so, so Clark, why would uh, I won't ask the question why the previous standard was called that? <laughs> so I think they just pick uh, a numbering scheme of some sort within the ISO standards. So. <laughs> Uh, mixed, mixed in there's an electrical engineering one of some sort right before it probably. Uh, so it doesn't look, there's, look like there's further questions. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you have other follow-up items, you can you can watch this on the, the uh, YouTube channel, of course. You can drop me an email, mike.ward at r3.com if there's topics you'd like covered. Otherwise, we'll talk to you again in two weeks.